Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage business anchor from China Global Television Network, Ms. Chang Li and her panelists. Thanks for joining us for the philosophy of investing session. Please sit down. Yeah, philosophy of investing in 15 minutes. So it's going to be snack versions of investment food for thought from two investing greats. To my left, Mr. Bruce Flatt, who's the CEO of Brookfield Asset Management, and of course Howard Marks, co-chairman of Oak Tree Capital Management. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. So I'm going to ditch the preamble and I'll keep my questions short because investing philosophy takes up a lot of time. So let me start by asking you, Bruce, how does Brookfield invest? And what are some big transactions that you've undertaken lately? Look, the, uh, the most important, what we buy is real assets largely. And uh, the most important thing that we've found over um, decades of investing in hard assets around the world, world, real estate, power plants, infrastructure, is to buy them at a fraction of replacement cost. And odds uh, give you a margin of safety if you can do that. So we look for capital dislocation in the world. Um, where are finding that in China at the moment. You know, we're finding it more, we're finding, other than special situations, we're finding that outside the United States. Um, and that's not to say that we haven't found things in the United States, but we've, we're doing a lot in India. Today, we just committed to buy um, a big telecom tower business in India. We bought a, a natural gas pipeline. Um, we did just uh, uh, commit to buy, or just closed on, uh, a, a large real estate purchase in Shanghai. So there's more opportunity. There's less capital in those markets in the United States, and then, which means there's more opportunity. And I do want to explain that uh, Brookfield and Oak Tree are now together, but still run separately. Right. Am I right, Howard? Yes, we're two autonomous firms uh, under common ownership. Right. So why don't you tell us about your recent experience in China? Because China-US concerns are dominating a lot of headlines these days. So where do you see China? going forward in the portfolios of global managers? Well, number one, I think that China has been hurt uh, by the trade war. And uh, obviously, their growth has been slowing um, to levels that I think the rest of the world would be envious of, but with which they are disappointed. Uh, they are anxious about the future. Uh, the political developments, I think, are as, as the last couple of years have demonstrated, are, are unpredictable. Uh, and that's the world we're living in. Of course, uh, the uncertainties in, in a market like China uh, tend to produce lower prices, higher prospective returns, and the buying opportunities that Bruce describes. So, you know, uh, in general, in investing, and especially in generally good times like today, is in most parts of the world, you don't get uh, bargain prices and exceptional risk-adjusted returns unless there's some hair on the situation, some uncertainty, uh, something that uh, tends to discourage the other bidders. And I think that uh, China exemplifies that to some extent today. And Bruce, how is Brookfield positioning for different scenarios in the China-US relationship going forward? You know, I would generally say we don't trade. Now, there are some businesses that we buy in our private equity group that trade across borders, but generally we go to a country, uh, we put capital into hard assets, we earn a return on them, and what's really important to us is the culture of respecting capital, the ability to operate with the standards that we operate with, and size to be able to deploy large amounts of capital, because generally our investments are scale. And so we don't actually trade over borders. So trade, trading relationships aren't, are not necessarily that important to us, other than if it, um, if it distinctly disadvantages a country for the longer term. And if it does, that may change your view on the longer term for that economy in the world. But the actual relationships don't really necessarily change what we do for a business. And Howard, as the world's foremost distressed 
debt specialist. You know, what sort of opportunities do you see now that there's this nervousness and uncertainty in the air? And we have been talking a lot about that at this FII. Well, clearly, Lay, there's very little distress, certainly in the U.S. today. When you have a, a, a good performing economy, as we do, and a generous capital market, and easy availability of uh, what we call rescue financing, uh, it's hard to imagine a scenario in which there's much distress. And in fact, uh, we have had uh, 10 years in a row of default rates uh, at a fraction of the historic norm. So clearly, this has not been a golden age for distressed debt investing. Now, as Bruce said earlier, the opportunities have been better outside of, uh, outside of the U.S. We've done considerably more pound for pound in Europe and, uh, and uh, an increasing amount in Asia. I think the important thing, what we think about today, is we see a, a two-stage process uh, for to have an exceptional opportunity in distressed debt. Number one, the logs have to be stacked in the fireplace. And that consists of, of what I call the unwise extension of credit. And, and, and we believe that there has been considerable unwise extension of credit as people have flooded money into uh, the various credit markets, especially private lending, to escape the, the paltry returns on cash, money market, treasuries, and high grades. Uh, the markets have been crowd, uh, crowded. Lenders have competed to make loans. And the way they do that is by demanding less yield, less safety, and weaker structures. And um, uh, one of these days... When does this come to a head? Well, that's the question. The, we, next, the other element we need after the logs have been stacked is an igniter, which usually comes in the form of a recession, plus a credit crunch, plus usually some exogenous influences. And, and the simple answer is no one can say. There's lots of conjecture around when the U.S. will have a recession. Uh, you know, people vote for 6, 12, 18, 24 months from now. Uh, nobody really knows where, you know, where uh, this is the longest economic expansion in history, so no one can say how long it's going to go. And, and our economy is still doing pretty well and is not marked by excesses. And since it has not seen excesses to the upside, it does not have to see a dramatic correction to the downside anytime soon. We have to prepare for opportunities in distressed debt, but we can't say that we have an idea of when they're coming. Okay, let's talk about cycles. You know, it's the theme of your books and memos. Bruce, right now we're having this conference against the backdrop of social unrest due to inequality and there's growing nationalism. What do you think is next? Are we entering a new social cycle? Look, first I'd say there's no doubt on the financial side that we're in a different phase of global um, fund flows. And interest rates appear like they're going to be low for a much longer period of time than uh, everyone expected. And um, that has dramatic ramifications on capital in the world, on businesses, and what's happening around the world in it. I'll, I'll, I'll flow that into the social situation in a second. But, but the first one is there's an enormous amount of savings in the world. And in fact, there's an enormous amount of both sovereign fund savings, but also people that are in the middle income areas that used to be able to earn a, a return on their capital that can't earn anything in a bank. And banks, while they probably won't do it, um, should almost be charging in many places of the world negative rates. And if that's it, we're going to have disruption in the social um, situation. And look, I think we've always had that. It just seems to be um, uh, more open today. And with social media, it's more impactful. And um, uh, so, I, look, I think it's, it's extremely important for all of us to consider it within every business that we operate. Howard. You want to come in on the social cycle? Question. Well, look, 50 years ago when I took graduate courses at the University of Chicago, we were taught that the only job of the corporation was to maximize 
uh, uh, profits and thus welfare for its owners. Uh, faith in the free market system reached its apex in the 80s and 90s under, under uh, Reagan and Thatcher and, and Clinton and some Bush. Um, I think that it, most people would say that that kind of thinking has gone too far, that profit maximization is not enough anymore, and that, and that capitalism has to be responsible. And uh, I think that uh, some business owners want to be responsible, and the rest of the business owners understand that only by doing so uh, will they continue to thrive. So I, I, my guess is that but the don't you make money off the failing greed of other people. Well, look, I think that I think that uh, I think that we're going to go through a swing of the pendulum in in, in which businesses. Um, make a little less money, focus a little less uh, obsessively on profit maximization, share the, the fruits more for its own uh, uh, protection and benefit. You agree, Bruce? Are you doing that at Brookfield? Look, I, I, our, uh, it, the, the biggest example I can give you is that we've, um, we, we are today the largest renewable privately owned renewable investor in the world. So, um, which is and, how much? Which is $50 billion worth of renewable uh, facilities, hydro, wind, and solar. Um, and, and we did that because we felt it was good business to be in renewables 25, 30 years ago. It's clear to us today that in looking in hindsight that there was profit maximization out of actually doing good. And I'm not sure we quite understood the, the, where the world was going with decarbonization, but it's crystal clear to us 50 years from now when we solve batteries that a lot more and a greater percentage will be renewables. And I, I just say to you that often if you um, can find the situations where you can actually maximize profit but also do good, that is really helpful to long-term business decisions. Yeah, and, I'm hearing that uh, and it's helpful. Many companies right now. And how would how is technology changing investing? Or do you think it is changing investing? Oh it's it's having a profound impact. Uh, 30, 40 years ago when I invested, it, it felt like the world was, a, was an unchanging place, a stable backdrop, and the actors performed in front of that unchanging backdrop. The cycles played out, events took place, etc. And, and now nobody, nobody thinks the world is an unchanging place today. Um, and uh, you know, uh, living with change is an important part of our lives. Uh, Oak Tree inv does not, is not generally a technology investor. We are an, an investor in, in uh, uh, more traditional industries. And yet, part of our job is to anticipate the impact of technology on our industries. Uh, the greatest example is the new newspaper industry, which 20 years ago was considered a defensive industry, a stable industry with a great moat, and, and uh, the, the leading newspaper in a town could not be competed against. And of course, now, um, the uh, newspaper industry is facing great challenges um, that are not going to go away. So, you know, you try to think of an industry that can't be disrupted, and it, it gets quite hard. Uh, we have to consider the potential for disruption in every investment we make. So right now, we're in this low growth, low rates right. environment. What's it going to take for that to change? And does this mean the monetary policies that we've been relying on isn't working? Well, I'm glad we have an hour. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, in, in, the, in the last half of the 20th century, post the war, uh, we went through the greatest period in history for an ec economic growth. We had the rebuilding from the war. We had the creation of the world's infrastructure, uh, uh, technological advances, managerial ad advances, um, and uh, globalization. And uh, the sum of those trends produced a high rate of growth 
uh, which lifted all boats. And this goes back to your previous question about inequality. Um, so, you know, a lot of people, I, I always imagine people saying, well, let's go back to normal, like the 80s and the 90s. And I don't think that that period was normal. That was an exceptional period. And I think we're not going back there. Uh, it, it seems that growth is lower all around the world. I think it would be folly to predict that it's going back there. Maybe it's not going to stay as low as it is. But, you know, growth, GDP growth, comes from population growth and increases in productivity. And in much of the developed world, population demographic trends are, are not a positive. It's, it's hard to imagine uh, going back. So if, if you take a slower rate of growth, uh, automation, globalization, then you have some people who don't find jobs, and then you have social trends which really command our attention. Bruce? I agree with my wiser partner. <laughs> Um, but look, I would only add the following. I think in all markets, even markets where there's lots of capital available, and in particular where there's markets where there's less capital available, in all markets, investors, managers um, that have capital available are prudent with it and run a good business can make money. And the one thing I'm entirely convinced about is in this world that we're in, owning businesses and owning investments in real assets and owning infrastructure and owning real estate is, and owning those in a derivative through debt, are the greatest and maybe the only, yeah. maybe the only place where large sums of capital can earn a reasonable return with moderate risk to be able to deliver the expectations for their constituents. And, uh, and that's probably the most important thing that, that I would say um, uh, about it. it. It's really just be prudent within the environment you're in. But what about valuations? What's looking very overvalued now to prompt worries about a bubble? Tech? You know, uh, well, obviously some tech, some social media is, is, uh, is particularly high priced. Uh, I don't think we're in an asset bubble. I think, I think that most, uh, most assets are selling uh, on the high side of fair or the beginnings of rich, but not ridiculously overpriced. Um, and of course, if you, uh, if you think that interest rates are going to lo stay low, uh, then then uh, a a income producing assets are very valuable. And, and the prices today, while generous, are not highly unjustified. Now, a few years ago when I interviewed Howard, he said, with you business TV people, it's either things are either hopeless yeah. or they're flawless. Very good. And uh, I, you know, then I've started thinking about that. So where should you get your information or where shouldn't you get your information for investing, Bruce. Look, I, 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 we, uh, we we invest in 30 countries in the world. What that means is that we have people on the ground that give us greater amounts of information than what you read in the newspaper. Oh, you need that. And uh, and what I would say is, while newspapers and business um, journalists are incredibly important to the world, especially with you sitting beside me. Um, Only for I, entertainment. What, what I would say is that to be able to be a great investor on a global basis, you have to become local. Mm -hmm. And if you're not in a country with people, with proper information, you read headlines, and headlines are never enough to actually make decisions. And, uh, and in that's fact, they can, make, they can help you make the wrong decisions. In fact, often they make, you can make the wrong decisions. And, uh, and sometimes, sometimes you can make the right decisions. I'm not saying that. But, but when you scrape down and get extra information, often the story is different. And, uh, and I think that's the most important thing for our business. And I'd like to add one thing, Lee. If you, if you get your information from the headlines, Everybody else reads the same headlines. Yes. What's your advantage? And getting it at the same time. Right. Now that In order to be a superior investor, you have to have an advantage. And you, you, 
either have to have facts that not everybody else has or an ability to interpret the facts that not everybody else has. Clearly, uh, merely getting your information from the media doesn't give you that advantage. And, and as Bruce says, uh, being on the spot geographically is, is very important. What about analyst reports? Discount those as well? Well, again, if, 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 if an analyst report is available to everybody, how can it constitute an advantage to you? You have to go beyond. You have to know more than, than others. Right. So, final question. How are you positioning your global portfolios over the next 10 years? Bruce? Look, so I, I would just say we invest always, um, but there are times when uh, in real asset infrastructure, private equity investing, one should be investing as much money as you have, and usually what happens is you don't have enough, yeah. but invest as much money as you possibly have and I can think back to a number of periods of time, the most recent being 2009. Any dollar you had, you knew if it got invested in the market, your worry was that if you put it in, it might be lower later, or, or that you had a, some other call on that capital. But you knew it was that period of time. I would say today, for private equity investing, it's keep investing, but be cautious. Yeah. And we're just making sure that we hold more cash than we probably ever have. We have more undrawn commitments than we ever have. Our business is better than we ever have. Uh, partnering with Howard, with Oak Tree, prepares us for the time when distress comes. Um, it, I guess the, the point being, uh, we're 11 years into a cycle, and it's a period of time when we should just um, we shouldn't have our foot on the accelerator. Right. I, I would agree 100 uh, percent. The most important decision one can make in the investment world at a point in time is between aggressiveness and caution. And this is not the time for aggressiveness. Um, but is I, it time for the foot on the brake? Not brake. Brake is an exaggeration, but I think invest with caution. Uh, not invest, not refuse to invest and not invest pell-mell. Thank you so much for your investing insights today. Thank you. Thank you. Investing grades of today with uh, over, was it $600 billion under management now? Getting there. <laughs> okay. More than 500 at least. Thank, yep. Thank you. Bruce Flatt, the CEO of Brookfield Asset Management. There are flies on this stage. Yes, <laughs> and uh, for eco-friendly venue. And also Mr. Howard Marks, the uh, author of many books which you should read as opposed to watching business TV and also the co-chairman of Oak Tree Capital Management. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Leigh.